And so now let's end with the most speculative thing, the fun thing, uh, which is black holes. Okay. So, all right. Now, if you look at the universe, if you look at the universe and you say, well, I see this interesting complexity. It's happening on a galactic scale at first. Galaxies are forming from, from these amorphous clouds. And then the next coolest thing that's happening a few billion years in the universe's history is replicating suns that are building out the periodic table, right? Nucleus, stellar nucleosynthesis and supernovas, right? And population three, two, and one stars, right? And then we finally get to organic chemistry and special M-class stars that can support liquid, long-term liquid phase on their surfaces and then organic chemistry, and now we're going to get life, right? And now the really interesting stuff that's happening is not a, sm a subset of replicating stars inside of a galaxy, which is a much smaller space than the whole galaxy, right. or, the, or actually the, the or actually the um, supercluster space that creates the galaxies is really the space you have to look at first for galaxies. And now we get down to just a sliver of surface between magma and vacuum on these special rocky planets in these galactic habitable zones around these special planets, right? And now that's where all the interesting stuff is happening. And then you look at that for the last four and a half billion years. And first, it's like bacteria are, are the bomb, right? Or cyanobacteria or, or archaeobacteria, which are hydrogen sulfide vents at the bottom of the oceans, right? And, and so then bacteria can go, you know, actually at least two miles down into the crust of our Earth, uh, the, the autolithotrophic bacteria. And, and also all the way as far out as the, as the nearest planet, because off of meteorites, skipping off of our planet. So bacteria have a ridiculous range, far greater than humans' uh, agency range so far, right? And then there's a special subset of uh, those organisms that create eukaryotes, and now we get this, this multicellular eukaryote, tool-using eukaryote like us, that emerges as an acceleration after all of these previous catalytic catastrophes, you know, like the uh, KT meteorite and ice ages and such. And we see faster and faster emergence of morphological complexity, and many people have studied this, right? And again, we don't know why, but in this special subset of the most complex forms on the planet. But those things are occupying smaller and smaller niches, right? So humans, basically, you know, we talk about the age of discovery where we go off and we, we, we discover these new continents, but we're really just colonizing a small fraction of the space, the most human habitable space of all the space that life colonized long before us. And then we create these complex cities, which are just tiny pinpoints of intelligence on the planet. You know, we have 500 of them, these are the leading innovation drivers of the planet. No longer countries now, it's these cities, right? And then there's special classes of technology that we build within those cities, these AI technologies, this metaverse stuff, the web, uh, that are now the leading edge of innovation on the, on the planet. And now we're talking about how all these nanotechnologies are driving us into further and further levels of, compl of complexity in inner space. And we look at a human being and we say, you know what, a human being, which is currently the most complex thing in the known universe, is an incredible example of space-time, energy, and matter compression, STEM compression, to create informational complexity. You've got 10 or 100 trillion unique synaptic connections between your two ears in a space, you know, like a three-pound piece of electromagnetic meat, right? Right billion unique connections. That's more stars than there are in the Milky Way galaxy. You have so much unique connectionist complexity, adaptive complexity in that space. And that's what's driving all human civilization, that level of stem compression. And now I'm talking to you about how we can create a cyber twin that's going to have that take that 100 trillion unique synaptic connections and scale it up by several more orders of magnitude beyond what you've got in the wetware. And now you're going to be doing even more in inner space in terms of density and, and, uh, and efficiency to, to allow you to understand and manipulate even more in outer space, have even higher levels of, you know, more sublime levels of consciousness. And then you run into folks like Seth Lloyd who say, you know, if we extrapolate this acceleration of computers, this Moore's Law thing, as far out as we can, what we get to is a black hole. In 2000, he wrote something called the, the Ultimate Laptop. I forget the actual... If you Google the ultimate laptop, you'll find the article, but the actual technical article has a different name. And what he's basically saying there is the most advanced of these systems, computational systems, look like black holes. Wow. And so you say, well, what's a black hole? Well, a guy named Lee Smolin wrote a beautiful book in 1994 called The Life of the Cosmos, and he was trying to understand what's called what physicists call the fine-tuning problem, which is why do some of the parameters of our fundamental parameters of the standard model of particle physics of our universe 
the forces, the values of the forces, strength of the forces, and the coupling, con uh, the uh, the uh, masses of the fundamental particles. Why do they have the particular values that they have? We don't have theory yet that tells us what they are, so we empirically plug these in. And what he basically determined is that eight of those 20 standard parameters, so what he calls the fundamental parameters, uh, the empirical ones, look like they're tuned for the creation of universes that make lots of black holes and that will last billions of years, that will allow complexity to emerge within it, right? Okay. And so, so now he has a model, a testable model, right, for a simulation testable model for what we might call developmental genes of the universe, that these that these parameters are part of this special subset of things that you can't, they're conserved over replication uh, cycles. You can't mess with them or you won't make functional universes. And so those parameters seem tuned for creating lots of black holes, which then, he argues in his book, create lots of universes. And most of these universes are going to probably be very low complexity universes. But as long as you have systems that can replicate and can randomly reassort the values of the parameters at the bounce, so that's what he calls the replication point at the black hole singularity that creates the new universe, then this universe that we exist in, which as far as we can tell has about 100 trillion or so black holes in the current right. activity, right? this universe is very good at making eggs, if you will, like frog eggs in a pond, right, for making more universes. And some subsection of those eggs are probably going to go on to develop interesting, complex universes. And so now you have to apply some kind of model to understand, uh, uh, to, to say, well, this is an interesting model for how universes could come to be, but how does intelligence fit into this? And Smolin doesn't answer this. Now, Ray Kurzweil has a beautiful series of arguments for intelligence, and he says in his latest movie, The Transcendent Man, he says you know, intelligence is the most important resource in the universe, and I think he's right. I mean, intelligence does seem to be the resource that the universe is, is self-organized to maximize because it creates, but it does it in a very interesting way. If we, our universe is astrobiologically uh, fecund, if there's lots of Earth-like planets in the universe, then mm -hmm. it separates them all out by a whole bunch of space between everything interesting. And now there is an evolutionary developmental argument at least one, for why that might occur. I'm going to give it to you now. Black holes, if, if we look like we're trending, we're trending towards this thing that looks like a black hole or a black hole near analog type future for us, the interesting question is, well, what happens to us in terms of space-time with regard to the other intelligent civilizations if they're all also trending to this black hole? Well, it turns out that once you get to a black hole, it's kind of, it's kind of like a one-way time travel device. That black hole, once you go into it, will merge with all the other black holes instantaneously in your subjective time if you're inside the black hole. So once you get to the event horizon for, of a black hole and you look outwards, everything else in the universe looks like it happens instantaneously, and you're basically frozen. Mm. And so you almost instantaneously merge with whatever other intelligences exist in your local vicinity of the universe. And there's in my article, I talk about some of the folks who've looked at dark energy and basically say that we're probably going to merge with the Andromeda galaxy and all the rest of the galaxies are going to disappear beyond us. So let's say there's uh, 10 intelligent civilizations in, the, in our galaxy and 10 in Andromeda. Well, that means there's 20 intelligent black holes that are going to be created relatively soon in universal time. And those intelligent, once they're created, those guys are all going to instantaneously be able to meet each other from their subjective time because time basically stops from your perspective once you get into the black hole. It's like a one-way time travel device. And that's really interesting because what that, what that suggests on first, on first uh, guess, and of course this is a complete you know, guess here we're making, but what that suggests is that there's a mechanism for how all these intelligences would meet each other in their local vicinities and how they would compete and cooperate with each other, naturally select then to create some new level of, of complexity. And so that's one model for how we might, uh, you know, how our universe might be a massively parallel evolutionary computation, a computational device, and how we might then take what we've learned evolutionarily and developmental and go on and create a new level of complexity in another replication.